I'd done a bunch of things and some little interviews here and there, and then eventually got random notes, and then the Eminem thing happened. So I was just really into him. Um, I was into a lot of like you know backpacker mid '90s hip hop, raucous yeah. records, and all that kind of stuff. And he was doing uh, you know just features on people's albums and, and like you know like '96, '97. And it was, I was just like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> and sort of followed him and told my editor, you know, like very, like a very green, enthusiastic assistant would, like, he's going to be famous. Let me write about him. And, you know, my editor was like, well, this is Rolling Stone. We barely write about hip hop and we don't write about unsigned rappers. And I was like, but this one's different. <laughs> so, you know, two years later when he got signed, um, my editor said, listen, Here's your, you know, you can write like a 300 word article about him, about the My Name Is video, which back when you had to sell physical CDs and MTV was actually a marketing tool still, uh, you put out a, a single about a month before the record, get ro rotation for it so that it would boost the sales of the record. Um, that was going crazy uh, with My Name Is. And so he said, you know, write about this kooky video. <clears throat> and by the time we sort of got it together, the Interscope had the numbers for the orders for what was going to be, you know, the first, the release of the record. So it was a much bigger thing. And he basically was like, all right, here's your chance. Don't mess it up. You're going to Detroit, write a cover story. And that's kind of what happened. And in that same issue, I actually covered the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction for the first time. This is, I wrote like 80% of one issue. I like stayed at home for three days. I'd never done that much and uh, banged it out, but it was like the greatest week of my life. So you went to Detroit and interviewed him. Was that very similar to the process of, you know, writing these books that you're doing now? No. <laughs> um, no, not at all. Um, that was a long time ago. He's very different now. And, um, you know, this was a guy who didn't even realize what was happening. Neither did his team. They really didn't have it together. Like, the guy who was the security guard at that point ended up writing a tell-all, so he wasn't really protecting uh, his rep. Um, it was really the seat of their pants. And it's all in the cover story. I just put every single thing that happened in there because that's what it seems like you should do. You know, yeah. I mean, anything interesting. So, um you know, he was like taking ecstasy and th throwing up and like, and just, just didn't talk to me for the first 24 hours. It was <laughs> like, and it's just stared at me. And I was like, what the hell am I, what is, I'm going to fail. Like what this guy's not even talking to me. How do you navigate a situation like that when your job is to get something from him, ID from dialogue, but he won't look at you. Like, how do you navigate that and get on? He looked at me. He was like just kind of glaring at me from like across the room. I mean, we were. I followed him to do three little club gigs, where he did like three songs of each. One of which was a Sweet Sixteen in Staten Island for some total mobster's daughter. That was amazing. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I didn't know. I was like, holy. Like, what am I going to do? Like, the dude's not talking to me. I mean, I knew I had a bunch more days and we had a plane trip and we were going to Detroit and maybe this is just, you know, he had been, he had done the David LaChapelle photo shoot that day, um, which David LaChapelle is a very colorful character. And there's tons of like trannies and he'd never been around like, you know, gay bisexual culture like that. So he'd gotten completely drunk because he was nervous and, uh, you know, he was, he was, supposed to be on the cover naked holding like a giant uh, stick of dynamite over his crotch we had some very conservative advertisers who objected and they had to move that to the inside page but that's how he had spent his day yeah. and you know he drank like a fifth of Bacardi because he was so nervous and didn't eat and when I got to the office I walked into the bathroom he was puking <laughs> when I went to say hello I was like oh. so um, <laughs> the day went from there and then he did a bunch of of ecstasy and did his club gigs and never messed up. It was the most incredible thing I've ever seen, but he was just in his zone and, and part of that zone was just like sizing me up because the next morning when we were like in the airport, then he was cool. We kind of bonded on this plane ride. He actually made his manager movies. Like I want to sit next to him. So we sat together in coach. If anyone can believe Eminem was coach back then. And, um, we sat together and just talked about life and stuff. And somewhere in there, he was like, he like leaned over to his manager. He's like, he's going to be the one who interviews my mom. That's the only one. And I was the only person that got permission to do that. I mean, other, you know, like tabloids have interviewed her, but yeah. you know, 
permission. So something happens, and then it became, you know, then he was, like, pretty open, and it was awesome. But um, that first night, I was like, oh, and here's where the writing career ends, you know? (laughs) 